good evening to all of you and welcome back to the digital platform of shadhan chandra mohavidyalaya hope you are well i'm here with the second session of the special lecture series conducted by department of english in this session we have a very a special guest and she is very young as well as very promising scholar right now she is an assistant professor of Dinobondu Andrews Institute of Technology and Management, as well as she uh, is a founder member of uh, Gender Benders. She is none other than Ashmi Basu. So I would like to welcome Ashmi on our digital platform. Ashmi, welcome to our digital platform. Thank you so much, Kotamda. It's been an absolute pleasure knowing you for such a long time, and then knowing you once again. as the convener of such an amazing amazing program which is so important now and so relevant given our present context uh, so thank you very much for inviting me i'm really excited and psyched to you know meet all of you here thank you very much ashmi for accepting our invitation but before ashmi delivers a lecture so i would like to tell inform all of you who are watching right now over here that the topic she is going to cover uh, basically gender and kamala das and the topic particular topic that she has chosen that i too call myself reclaiming the individual in kamala das's and introduction so this is the particular topic that she has uh, decided to uh, deliver on so uh, before she delivers i would like to request all of you who are watching right now over here if you have any question feel free to write in the comment box so whenever you write in your in the comment box your question we can get those questions and we will take this question to the speaker ask me but obviously at the end of the lecture so please be patient and uh, if you have feel free to drop your question in the comment box so i would like to go back to ask me and uh, welcome ask me uh, for your lecture so please proceed okay uh, so thank you once again gautam da i'll just start off here uh, so this is a, a very you know a very interesting uh, topic today when uh, we are fighting all over uh, for what our identity is how do we really introduce ourselves what do we say about ourselves who are we really i will just move straight on my lecture is not going to be very formal i i don't do formal very well so it's uh, going to be as conversational as informal and students who have uh, you know been there with me for a long time they know it by now so i don't think i need to explain any of that um the word introduction has become frightfully common these days you know uh, i would be surprised really if there is anybody listening to me here who is acquainted with the english language and is not uh, acquainted with the term introduction um as uh, as children we are you know all taught to introduce ourselves we are taught to say certain things about ourselves as introduction remember your uh, first day in school or later in college i mean it all begins with hi i am so and so right um we grow up and we we keep meeting new people and then our introductions change we go on adding things to that introduction and um sometimes we introduce other people sometimes we are introduced sometimes we have this huge audience just like i i have right now i hope i think uh and sometimes there are a handful sometimes there's just one or two person who you are going to introduce yourself to now um why am i playing around with this with this word i guess because this in some way is related to the central idea of what i hope to deliver today um have you have you ever thought of the numerous introductions you have given of yourself till this point of time um have you have you ever thought that you actually might be really repeating a set of labels you know you might be just saying things uh, that can have a hint of your sex your caste uh say your religion your economic class your education your social status but uh, an introduction at the same time that might not be saying anything about you at all anything about the person who you are or who you hope you are 
or who you hope you want to be to other people. So introduction might contain all of these categories and not contain anything at all, anything that is related to the real you. Um, so tell me this, that are you just anyone who's listening? I mean, or just here. Are you just a sum of all those categories that you know you have in an application form when you tick or cross? I don't think that we are that, uh, you know, reductible to, to such simplistic categories. I don't think anyone is. So my question is, where are you? In all the times that you have introduced yourself, uh, has it really been about you? An introduction by Kamala Das is an account of numerous conventional identities, numerous categories, numerous layers that is heaped on us from our childhood. And they are so perfectly, so strategically heaped on us that it, they become very natural, you know, they become very normal to us and to the other people who we are introducing ourselves to. So it, there comes a point when nobody asks for the person anymore. Nobody is concerned with the individual anymore. An introduction is about all of this. An introduction at the same time is also about breaking down all of these categories. As Kamala Das does, and as the title of my paper says, by reclaiming herself as an individual in this poem. Introducing Kamala Das. Um, Gautam, you could uh, you know, change the slide. OK, OK, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so, um, yeah, so uh, it is difficult to introduce a person like Kamala Das, you know. I mean, uh, what, what can I say about this um, extravagantly imaginative lady? She was uh, born in 1934 in Malabar in an upper caste Nair family. Uh, next slide, Gautamda. in an upper caste Nair family that her great grandmother was the daughter of the Raja of Punnathor and her mother Balamani Amma was a Padma Bhushan recipient. Um, well, I can tell you that she wrote under the pen name of Madhavi Kutti, that she has won the pen Asian poetry prize that uh, she uh, you know, converted to Islam when she was 65 years old, that she got married when she was 15, that she wrote uh, her very, very controversial autobiography called Ente Katha or My Story in English. That she wrote her first poetry anthology called Summer in Calcutta in 1965, from where this present poem and introduction is under discussion. And that uh, she was this magnanimous person with an imagination that we cannot imagine to conceive. Uh, however, all of what I just said, uh, all of that is found uh, in the internet, on the internet. It's, it's, it is, you just Google it. You Google Kamala Das and you get all of it. So what is there that I can tell you? Well, um, I will not tell you anything. I will allow the, or rather, I will uh, request Kamala Das, the poet herself, to introduce her beauty through her poem, through her words, to all of you. Mm -hmm. And let's see, uh, in her own words, in an introduction, how far she allows us to get close to her. Now, I will be uh, discussing various spaces that she has dealt with in this particular poem. And uh, they will be consisting of the linguistic space, the physical space, the sexual space, um, and I will be slowly, you know, trying to carve out how she has tried and successfully attained herself through her words. The poem uh, begins after a very, uh, very beautiful dig at the lack of participation of women in the political scenario in positions of importance and power, where she says that I don't know much about politics. I can just tell you the 
names of these big powerful name uh, people in politics beginning with nehru like uh, the days of uh, the week months etc she is uh, i think hinting at uh, the lack of uh, participation of women in positions of real significance out here even after india received its independence however the next year when she is writing the poem just the next year the scenario changes as indira gandhi comes up however we are still in 1965 when we are reading uh, an introduction and i think this uh, dig is very important given the kind of uh, you know uh, political awareness that she had as a child and we will see what it was like so she begins with this very direct uh, very very honest kind of an introduction i am indian very brown born in malabar now um we you know to friends who are foreigners they often say oh i am an indian you know i belong to this beautiful colorful country and also a very uh, you know problematic place right now but uh, how many times really all of you who are here who you know uh, are listening how many times have you really emphasized on your skin color while introducing yourself i don't think many of you have done that i haven't i mean i haven't ever gone and told anyone that you know i um, i am an indian and i was born in uh, calcutta rather calcutta and um, i'm uh, dusky i'm very dusky i i don't go about saying that none of us do i think but she does she uh, rather emphatically says very brown uh, there is an obvious and distinctive uh, focus upon the skin color as we can see here our poet uh, identifies as very brown we probably relate uh, this assertion to the protest against the fairness obsession that is still a rage in india but if we go back to her life you know Kamala Das was a little girl in the colonized India, and uh, had a long and serious association with the consciousness of being a colored person. And when I say she was a colored person, she was treated because of her color to be someone who was inferior. Um, in her autobiography, uh, My Story, she writes. we did not tell our parents of tortures we underwent at school for wearing under the school uniform of white twill a nut brown skin um this is uh, you know it it refers to one incident where uh, her brother who she studied with uh, in at school uh, he was attacked and he was uh, made to bleed and uh, they were uh, they were you know called blacky and they were always always bullied so from there the atrocities you know they could have stopped right there but what happens is both for sexism and for racism we internalize the discrimination so deeply within ourselves that it just doesn't stop uh, you know affecting us when we are outside home our own people who we love who love us they subject us to the same racism to the same sexism as unfortunate as it may sound it is like this and uh, there is a place where kamla das writes that uh, her her grandmother would uh, scrub her and bathe her in turmeric and milk so that she could attain over that one beautiful lighter shade of skin which obviously she couldn't attain all her life um you know the problem here is it is a very sad battle you know with your skin uh nobody understands that a little more of melanin never did anybody any harm and at the sa- same time a little less of melanin never made anyone great or better than you tamala das however is here to an individual and you may ask me how well she is an individual here because she emphasizes on the very thing that everybody along with the indian society has thought to be a disadvantage she focuses on being quote unquote very brown she accepts it 
she doesn't only really accept it she flaunts it she celebrates it i can almost say that she is happily brown and despite all the unhappiness that her skin color might have given her she looks for and finds a deep identity there and it is this outside acceptance that allows her to find herself her individuality in the physicality i will go into the linguistic space and ask gautam da to change the slide again i'm sorry to be a bother no it's 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 okay <laughs> okay okay um going back uh, to the linguistic space here before i begin speaking and uh, looking for kamala das in her words i would like to talk about yet another phenomenal woman called helen sisu uh, who wrote about something called the patriarchal binary thought go to the next slide yes patriarchal binary thought now what is patriarchal binary thought this is um a sort of a world view which looks at everything in a binary okay for example uh, head heart father mother reason emotion active passive culture nature and the list goes on now if you look carefully you will find that the woman is always on your right hand side of this these pairs okay that is uh, she is the heart the mother the emotion she is passive and she is nature now you may ask me that so what is wrong with that i mean what is wrong with uh, being aligned to emotion and passivity and nature well nothing nothing is wrong with being aligned to all of that the problem is here that our governing social system which goes by the name of patriarchy that makes a difference between these binaries that says that being emotional passive uh, aligning to nature to mother all of this is inferior to being head father reason active and culture the problem is that these values that i just you know enlisted these are the so called male values and are superior because they are male values they should be ingrained in men and the others the 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 emotion passivity nature all of that are female values and by only that reason inferior now language language is everywhere you are always expressing you are always communicating when are you not active in your language even when you are dreaming you are dreaming even that has a language our thoughts you know they translate into language and the language we therefore speak in is a very important one it is not just a medium of expression all the partialities all the biases all the sexism that a language contains has its impact on our thinking has its impact on what we say has its impact on how we say what we say now um when we have this intense programming and we talk you will see we often say mankind i mean it just comes like reflex mankind we don't say human kind very often i'll go on to a very simple everyday use of a phrase um he or she i mean even if you start writing she or he from today you will see how difficult it is to you know start and get it correct always you are bound to go back to he, he or she because that's how you're programmed because that's how that programming has got naturalized and you feel that is the way to do it now how do we battle this sexism that is inherent in the language helen sisu told women to write helen sisu said that women must write themselves down and must create their own history women must use their own point of view 
to write about their experiences. And so did Virginia Woolf, uh, you know, time and again, ask women to write about themselves, to write about their history in their language. Now, um, Sifu called this feminine writing ekritya feminine, which translates as feminine writing, as I've already said. And this writing is a counter to the patriarchal uh, way of uh, using language, to the modes, uh, you know, to, to the syntax, to the kind of tight gripped logic and reasoning, uh, to the kind of disparaging attitude towards emotion and intuitive experience that is at the center of women's writing. I will go uh, on to, as I had promised earlier, to uh, Kamala Das's own words. And here she says, I speak uh, three languages, write in two, dream in one. Don't write in English, they said. English is not your mother tongue. Why not leave me alone? Critics, friends, visiting cousins, every one of you, why not let me speak any language I like? The language I speak becomes mine. I would like you to relate Sisu here, where she is saying how very hers the language becomes in Lekriti or feminine, how very much a woman's own experience, her own soul, her own elements, her language becomes, her own body, her language becomes. I would like you to uh, correlate this and just go back to Kamala Das again, where she's saying, um, the language I speak becomes mine, mine alone. It is half English, half Indian, funny perhaps, but it is honest. It is as human as I am, don't you see? It voices my joys, my longings, my hopes, and it is useful to me as cooing is to crows as or roaring to the lions. It is human speech, the speech of the mind that is here and not there, a mind that sees and hears and is aware, which is once again an inversion of what she said earlier, that she is unaware of politics, where she's you know, countering and you know, kind of reintroducing herself, very typical of Kamala Das, to break the very linear method of talking to break the very typical way of writing. And she's you know, all disjointed and she will connect and reconnect things here and there. She's saying that uh, her speech is not the deaf blind speech of trees in storm or of monsoon clouds or of rain or the incoherent mutterings of the blazing funeral pyre. She, you know, almost stands in glory when she says this, I have never read anything that uh, you know has more individualism than these lines you know you can you can see how how terribly powerful these lines are how how terribly expressive these are and how simple at the same time how simple how meaningful how completely direct and straight from the heart this is this was a lot of the spirit of kamala das if you go through her works at length I would, uh, however, also like you to, you know, uh, you know, focus on the number of times she writes I, my, mine, as if in a desperate assertion towards naming something as her own. Her language is of her own making, and it does not identify with the language that is normative. But that is no surprise to us, because if you know Kamala Das's life, then you will know that she never did normative. And she was also good with it. I would use the word cool. I know Gautam that would be really furious because I'm using informal words here. She's really no, no, cool. It's okay. Move on. Move on. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you for the license. Um, <laughs> the confessional tone is very Kamala Das. The confessional tone is very hers. The informal Conversational expression is very hers. The deep honesty of each word as they stay is very hers. And I'll tell you what is hers also. It's a courage. 
you know um, the courage of mastering the language of the colonizer is always looked upon as a big deal for all the writers poets who were writing in the english language this has always been a place of dilemma because they are using the colonizer's tongue which they are not supposed to invite it they are not supposed to use it they are supposed to stand up for themselves and their language but here kamala das not only uses that particular language she masters that particular language and she says that it is completely my discretion as to in what language i feel comfortable as to what language i should use i also use my mother tongue and i also use this language and i don't think that anybody should dictate me as to what language i should use what number of languages i should use and how i should express what is inside of me so this whole hearted courage is also hers and for this courage poet balak chullikar called her the first feminist emotional revolutionary of her time and i think that uh, it is a very very apt phrase it's a, it's a very very apt description for kamala das i will uh, go on to the gender aspect of uh, this particular poem and uh, i will be going back to one of my favorite feminists uh, one of those women who i have always you know found a deep connection towards though i have i i have been you know uh, in touch with her only for around i think 6 years or so i feel that sync with her right from the first time i touched her work um you know we are we are all born persons then we become what society wants us to become women men and if our bodies do not match the expectations of the society then we simply become outcasts and uh, you know the outcasts a transgender a lesbian gay someone who doesn't uh, you know who doesn't speak in a certain language is an outcast someone who cannot belong to a certain social and economic class is an outcast someone who is a reserved category is an outcast and what is our reason for uh, you know creating all these so called outcasts the simple reason uh, that they are different i mean think of it you know anybody who you have felt is different they arouse inside of you a feeling of isolation we seldom feel that how about going on to that person going over to that person and trying to understand is that person really different or if she or he is different can i also understand the difference and live with it but no we are not ready to live with other people's differences but we happily expect that other people will live with our differences now um going here you know i would like to have this very brief discussion because i assume that this lecture is for undergraduate students i will have this little discussion on uh, gender and sex so the human body you see is um, assigned a sex at birth that may be male or that may be female depending on genitalia um you might be surprised to know that um, gender which is actually a set of norms according to which a man or a woman is expected to behave in society is not immediately associated with a child at birth but sex is the basic difference between the terms gender and sex is that uh, gender is plain biology it is about the ovary it is about the uterus it is about the vagina it is also about the testicles it's about the penis it's about the scrotum this is all that uh, sex is this is biology plain physical biology um however what is gender gender is a woman should do these things 
a man should do these things and they are always different a woman should uh, not laugh very loudly a woman should not assert herself very much a woman should not try to involve in very many decision making processes a man on the other hand uh, should always go about flexing his masculinity a man should not cry in public a man should not display his emotions in public or his vulnerabilities so all of this that is here gives rise to a sort of weak femininity for women and a toxic masculinity for men either of them are unwelcome and both of these you know these gender identities they render a person at a very deplorable condition almost all of the times now um how do we become men women and all that the society wants us to be this becoming is what simone de beauvoir has also written about in her often quoted line one is not born but rather becomes a woman this is about socialization this is about what society tells you to do how society tells you to walk talk behave um kamala das refers again and again to they they tell her to not speak in english to not write in english they tell her to be this to be that and i will quote her <clears throat> i was child and later they told me i grew i would like you to um you know associate the poem with whatever i just said okay they told the girl the little girl that she grew so nobody is concerned whether a 15 year old girl is really ready for intercourse is really ready for marriage she was married off at 15 but uh, you know they said the society said you are 15 you are ready they said go to the next slide yeah they said dress in sarees be girl be wife they said be embroiderer be cook be a quarreler with servants fit in i mean look at the obviousness of you know this desperate attempt of socialization fit in they have these little boxes of roles and they expect that kamala das a woman like her uh you know a, a a vigorous energy like her or even us the lesser mortals are our dreams so small that we will fit in with all of these dictators dictated boxes i think that would be really a sad end for us um dress in sarees be girl be wife be embroiderer be cook be a quarreler with servants and as per patriarchal standards i am going back to patriarchal binary thought being a girl being a wife is just playing a gender role it's not being an individual be embroiderer not a writer not uh, a pilot be uh, not a scientist be embroiderer be cook be a quarreler with servants fit in oh belong cried the categorizers don't sit on walls or peep in through our lace draped windows don't have opinions don't go beyond the closed windows stay inside stay inside the kitchen stay inside the home stay inside that particular area that we have demarcated for you be amy or be kamala or better still be madhuri kutti it is time to choose a name a role there they actually say that 
don't play pretending games don't play as schizophrenia or be a nympho don't cry embarrassingly loud when jilted in love um now who are they you know they are people who we all know they are the people that society consists of they are the people who stay just next to your house they are the people who really applaud when you fail at something they are everywhere they are uh, the fault finders they are those who don't live our lives but they never back off at the same time from telling us what we should be doing so you know when according to them as i had said uh she was grown enough for marriage and she was married off at 15 to a man who could never give her the kinds of love the kinds of adoration that she was looking for you know um if you go through and i would urge everybody to go through uh, ente katha to go through my story where she writes that she urged you know she yearned so much for love that she would you know spend a lot of time in the cemeteries and uh, she would actually converse to these dead people and she said that i could love these dead people as deeply as i could love the old the the living ones she says there that it is so good to love the dead because from the dead there emanates no cruelty she writes uh, when uh, you know talking about her marriage in an autobiography she writes that you know i wanted this man to really pat me on my head i wanted this man to you know uh, you know this man to to hug me to embrace me to tell me that all the right in my head will be over all the cruelty that i have received from the society for for being brown from my own father all the compulsions that i have faced all the atrocities that i have seen back in boarding school all of that is going to be all right that is all that she had asked for but her husband had wanted something else from her and turns out it is more of carnal hunger that he was there to satisfy he could never give kamala the love the pure unadulterated love that she just wanted and um that particular yearning that she had in her heart as a child that died a slow painful death in the arms of her husband but since again it is kamala das that we are talking about here who lives on with her brutal openness even 11 years after her death she once again gets back at her oppressors fighting the long arduous battles of pregnancy because of loveless unions with her husband raising above every accusation from having too many personalities schizophrenia and uh, you know symbolizing an unquenchable sexual thirst nympho she writes uh, i wore a shirt and my brother's trousers cut my hair short and ignored my woman now you know this uh, has often often been you know ridiculed and criticized that you you cannot just become someone else just like that just you know cutting off your hair or wearing the male clothes doesn't make you a man of course it doesn't it doesn't but what is to be celebrated here the individual who i am talking about rears her head here that is to be celebrated it is a step she is trying when we try to do something right after so much of wrong that has happened to us we may not be successful at the first go yes you don't become a man if you dress like a man if you ignore your womanliness you don't become a man you don't have the male privileges of course you don't but what is important is that you try it is one of those steps that you take to break out of your chains most of us live all our lives and die without even trying 
and thank god that we have someone who even with the fear of failing she still tries so all of us have become the people we are today and if we look back it is because of all the confines that we have subject submitted to uh but here is a woman who has not stopped at the suffering she has suffered oh my god she is talking about marital rape absolutely openly she is talking about how uh, he hurt her again and again and again in one night uh but she has not only come out of that suffering she has not only tried her best to come out of that suffering she has already started unbecoming she has already started undoing her programming she is standing up for herself she is standing up from the mess and she is unchaining herself from the safety of conventions she has taken up herself by decluttering everything that is familiar the suffocating rules rituals appearances pretenses and now as we go further on in the poem uh do keep in mind that the year is 1965 and not 2020 do keep in mind that because now these things may sound very you know okay fine okay our step what's the big deal about it true but uh, in 1965 whatever she was doing whatever she was saying my story came out in 1977 whatever she was writing that shook people that shook the civilized society she writes uh as we go ahead uh of her desire for love she writes of a uh, man as a hasty river she writes of a uh, man as a robust energy she writes of man as a free individual as a free being and she compares man to the stature that a woman is rendered to and that is of a passive sea the ocean who just receives the river who is passive you know if you uh, are interested in gender and history then you will know that uh, there was this particular seed and the field analogy that uh, the man is the active agent of uh, you know multiplying the the you know human race the man is the seed and the woman is the passive receiver the woman is as passive as the field so the woman basically has nothing to do the woman is powerless the woman is never in control the man is and it's a very similar analogy here where kamala das is saying that uh, you know the, the man is the river full of the vibrancy movement control and the woman is just someone who accepts love like the ocean accepts this, the river if and when it comes to her however i'll tell you once again where is the individual here the individual here is a disillusioned sometimes defeated but conscious individual the conscious woman that yes this is my condition i am expected to be passive and perhaps i am passive sometimes because of the way i have been brought up but i know my condition and when i know that this is the ailment this is the disease this is the problem this is the programming i can think of taking a step to go ahead of it the first step of curing yourself is to know that you have the disease in the first place so her individuality rests in the consciousness of this particular difference she writes it is i who drink lonely drinks at 12 midnight in hotels of strange towns it is i who laugh it is i who make love and then feel shame i am the beloved and the betrayed i have no joys which are not yours no aches which are not yours i too call myself i these lines have unprecedented fearlessness the kind that comes from truth and when some you know you have discovered yourself and 
you don't feel the compulsion to conform anymore. She does refer to herself as every woman. And the reference reiterates, however, the individuality that every woman has in her, but hides it in order to be the women that the society expects them to be. Thus finds commonness with women just to discover the uncommon, the rare. And she calls out for a protest here. The protest against those differences, those manufactured, created differences that push women indoors, that limit women to their bodies, that limit women to their homes, that limit women to the constructs of patriarchy. And her individuality shines through this protest also. Because if you notice the lines, if you read them again and again, you will see that this protest is not of anger. There is pain. There is agony. But there is also a lot of love. There is almost a sense of wanting to become one. A strain of pure empathy for the human sections, in this case men, who enjoy the privilege of being individuals. Here, when she is writing about women who drink in strange hotels at 12, she is obviously not writing about the typical woman who is probably still working and will go to bed and to wake up before daybreak. She is writing about women who are either by circumstances or by self-assertion found themselves out of the house at an unearthly hour. She is writing about also those women who are explicit about their desires. And Kamala Das, you know, uh, Merrily Vaisport wrote this incredible book on Kamala Das, uh, which is basically a memoir of their friendship, uh, The Love Queen of Malabar, where she celebrates Kamala Das and her incessant urge for love. And she is very, very explicit, very, you know, clear and very open and almost proud about her desires. Because these desires are natural. These desires are normal. And these desires have got nothing to do with a woman's character. We always talk about chastity and we always make it very specific to women. I mean, if you if you really talk about chastity, the first idea that comes is of a woman and then of the so-called categorized characterless women, the so-called problematic women. OK, uh, but, you know, when Kamala Das refers to these women, she is not in fear anymore. She is referring to these women as if they exist with their own right. This is the individuality of Kamala Das in her expression, in her words. As I had said in the beginning, that Kamala Das herself, through her poem and introduction, will take all of us to who she is. This is what she has been doing throughout the poem. She's taking us from her identi you know, identity journey from one eye to the last eye. If you have noticed there, you know, uh, before I finish this lecture, uh, this poem begins with I and also ends with I. Now, I don't know how much sense it would, it would make to you if I say that uh, I think this poem is Kamala Das herself. When she is writing an introduction, She's not only introducing herself, she is what she writes. Again, if you look at feminine, if you're feminine, it is very much in sync with that concept. I am what I write. Uh, you know, this poem is Kamala Das. It is not only an introduction of all the categories that, 
the entire presentation along with the lecture it's more or less done just the end bit was left and i think you all have seen whoever you was here you you all have seen um the you know the ppt as well so it's it's more or less that but just before i go and i am done with uh, this entire uh, you know this this very um how should i how should i um describe this experience i think it's it's been uh, really taxing to an extent because i was trying to decipher this woman uh, kamala das who uh, according to me she has no limits i mean neither her imagination is limited nor her her desires nor her you know the kind of ways she sets for herself the kind of distances she covers inside your head the kind of changes she can uh, you know do you know in within with, within changes she can make within your soul when you're reading her works so um i'm towards the end of it and i would like uh, all of you to please uh, take note of the fact how this particular poem and introduction it begins with i and it ends with i now this poem is uh, a journey from the first i to the last and it is also something that reminds us how you know kamala das is so much of an individual that she takes whatever she makes the stuff of her writing from who she is you will see how intensely personal her writing is how intensely um you know received through her own blood and own veins her every single piece of work is so if as i was saying then that if it does make you know uh some sort of a sense to you i think this poem is kamala das as i was saying it is not only an introduction uh of all the categories that you know have been put on her the category of being a woman the category of being a wife the category of being a loveless um you know a wife in someone's home the category of being this particular woman who has had children after children out of unions that she had not desired from her soul the category of being a woman writer who dares to write in english so many categories okay the category of being brown the category of being colonized the category of being a woman to begin with so she uh you know she she has dealt with all these categories as as we all also deal with and she has very successfully become all of this and equally successfully she has unbecome all of this you know she is the first i she is the subject she is the one in power she is the one in control of the choice of language and of the language uh, the 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 soul of the language itself her expression her life her body and at the same time she is also where she stops she is this entire poem she is this entire work of art she draws her material her dreams her desires her definitions from who she is from the person she has become in this huge messy complicated exhausting battle of reclaiming her own self again and again and again she carves out her own agency from within her soul from the individual who she has reclaimed from every other identity that the society has time and again heaped on her imposed on her here we are reading of a life that patriarchy with all its muscles could not force to fit here we have a woman who has not only reclaimed herself her space her individuality her person but she has also given us 
the readers a task to try to declutter all those categories and meet our own selves for at least once in our lives. Kamala Das has lived all her life being herself. But for us, even if we consider people with lesser imaginations, for us, she has given us this idea, this trigger through this particular introduction that we do not need to be the conventional introductions that we give of ourselves. We do not need to be everything that we are always forced to conform to. We do not need to be anything that society or people or what they tells, tell us to be. We can just be ourselves, reclaiming ourselves every day from this particular mess of these complicated categories. We can just be so real so that we can sleep with this consciousness of being able to unprogram ourselves despite all the temptations, you know, to be one in the mass. That would be the end of my lecture, an introduction by Kamala Das. Uh, reclaiming the individual in this particular poem and I really really uh, apologize once again but uh, we couldn't help it was a technical glitch and I hope that I uh, have been able to say something that uh, would make you think about certain things that is also you know uh, chaining you down weighing you down that is what I look forward to in each of my classes I hope to come back to you once again and thank you for this opportunity, Gautamda. This has been a sheer pleasure on my part to come and read Kamala Das and to explain it and to find the individual and not only find the poet but also find myself somewhere in it. Thank you so much, Shadun Chandra Mohabiddaloy, for giving me this opportunity. So I hope that uh, I will have more reasons to come back to you. And if you have questions, then please send me uh, in my messenger inbox and I will get back to all of you because it is difficult for me to answer so many questions right now as we have already you know we are not in the kind of sync in which we began so please let me know if you have questions please let me know and I will try to answer each of them um, thank you very much once again all of you thank you students thank you everybody who has been here for me and uh, for us in, in, a, in a greater wider scale so Good night and I hope to come back again. Thanks.